So, you've decided. It's time to test out Hyper-V and VMM and figure out what all the buzz is about. But you're slightly challenged in that you don't actually have the hardware to make that happen. Well, let me see if we can help you. In this recording, I plan to use desktop class hardware and show you how we can configure these for Hyper-V and utilize Virtual Machine Manager. To get us going, I've got two desktop pieces of kit. Uh, in my case, these are really old uh, Dell PowerEdge servers, somewhere around five years old. And I've got about four gig of RAM and 150 gig hard disk with a single CPU. And on my second node, which is quite similar, I have a little bit less uh, RAM. I believe it's simply two gig, but a slightly larger hard disk. Just mixing it up to make it look quite similar to what you may have at home. In addition, I have one additional server, um, another desktop with another 2 gig of RAM. Um, and again, on this particular machine, I installed Windows Server 2012, the release version. And I added the Active Directory domain controller uh, services to this machine. Um, I also went ahead then and installed uh, System Center Virtual Machine Manager 2012, the SP1 version and opted to use just a local SQL instance for that installation. S then the only other task I completed was turning off the Windows firewall just to keep things simple in our home lab, turned on remote desktop so I can demonstrate to you guys from this recording and joined the actual test machines to the test domain. So just to recap, three workstations, all low spec and I have simply installed Windows Server 2012. I haven't deployed any Windows updates or any of the hardening stuff that one would normally do. Um, and I'm using what is essentially desktop class equipment. Um, as a result of that, I've also restricted myself to utilizing only one network adapter. So on these machines, they happen to be uh, old Dell racked boxes with two built-in Ethernets. I've disabled the second Ethernet on them. Uh, the idea being that in your case, you may only have desktops with a single Ethernet. And I am going to try and do this configuration under the assumption that you don't even have uh, managed switch gear. So simple 20, 30 buck uh, network switches to do this job. Okay, so. That's the baseline. That's where we're going to work from. Let's see if we can bring this challenge to life. Virtual Machine Manager is where we're going to start doing most of the work. And the very, very first thing that I'm going to do in Virtual Machine Manager is I'm going to try and add our two new hosts. So first things first, I'm going to click on the ribbon. I'm in the fabric view of Virtual Machine Manager. I highlight the hosts and I'm going to say I want to add my Hyper-V hosts. Because we joined the systems to the domain, the first option in the wizard is the most appropriate. And then we need to provide some credentials that VMM can use to connect to the VM hosts. Now, in a production environment, this would generally be a special account. Um, however, since I'm working in a uh, test lab at home just to prove the concepts, I'm going to just utilize the domain administrator. I'm going to make a role for that, and I'm simply calling it the VM admin access role. And I'm going to provide the uh, domain details for my administrator. So it's DigiNerve Lab and Administrator and our very secure password. Okay, that was really interesting. Now, with the Run as account defined. I highlight the run as account to say I'm going to utilize this for the wizard so that it can talk to my uh, workstations. And I will now go ahead and I'll provide the name of the workstation. So I'm using PDC, standing for Primary Data Center. Remember, this is a really big lab with just three machines. Um, and I'm going to go to the VM host one, and I've called the other node PDC VM host two. Now, if all goes well, what should happen now is that Virtual Machine Manager will go out, try and find those two hosts, and then using the account that we just grab it, he'll figure out what operating systems and what hypervisor are installed on those. So, all well, select the two that he's found, and we ask it to move forward. 
Now before it goes forward, Hyper-V sorry, VMM pops back and says there is no Hyper-V on these machines. Um, and because you've been adding these as actual hosts, I'm going to sort that out for you. So essentially, VMM will enable the Hyper-V role on our hosts, and if there's any restarts or stuff that needs to be done, it will do that for us too. The only thing you need to make sure is that your hardware, so your desktop class devices, actually do support virtualization. So if it's in the BIOS, just make sure that you flick the switch to turn on uh, virtualization. Otherwise, after installing the Hyper-V role, you'll find that the Hyper-V services don't actually start. Okay, next one on the page is the host groups. We haven't done anything with these, so we'll just leave it at the defaults and put everything into the hosts. And I don't have a clue where I'm going to put my virtual machines just yet, so we leave the rest of the page blank and let the wizard get on with its job. Now this is going to take a few minutes, but we can see immediately that their jobs are running. Um, and essentially VMM is telling us in detail what he's trying to do. So straight away he's attempting to add the new virtual machine host. And the very first task in that process is putting out the VMM agent to the host so that we can go ahead and do the configurations. So once that part of the process is done, we'll then find that the host now needs to get enabled for Hyper-V. And finally, uh, once Hyper-V has been enabled in the operating system, and if we flick back, you can just see there I just caught the host actually both rebooting at the same time, um, as VMM has uh, essentially got the agents and the VMM Hyper-V roles uh, sorted out. Virtual Machine Manager will wait for those hosts to come back, and it will complete the configuration, and then finally let us know how things are going. I'm going to uh, hold for a few moments until that process is complete. While we wait for the Hyper-V hosts to do their work, um, let's just shrink away the jobs window for now and take another look over on the actual fabric. And the next thing that we'll take a look at is the actual logical networks. Now logical networks are quite important in Virtual Machine Manager 2012, but in the SP1 version things have changed a little bit. Previously, for every VLAN that you would define, um, you would essentially create a new logical network. Um, but now we have the ability to use logical networks in association to VM networks. It's a two-tier approach. Now, if you want to understand a little bit more of why and how that works, then I recommend you grab a few minutes of your time and watch my Subvision uh, presentation called Untangling the Network with Virtual Machine Manager 2012. That will give you a little bit better insight to what's going on here. But for now, let's just assume that you understand what we're doing, um, and I'll walk you through the actual process. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a brand new logical network, and I'm going to call this logical network the actual fabric. Now, the idea here really is that this logical network will be utilized for fabric-based communications. And what, what are fabric-based communications? That's traffic that essentially happens to go between our Hyper-V hosts or from our Hyper-V hosts to our file servers for storing our VHDs and maybe our iSCSI for our storage or even our cluster stuff or live migration. All of those things that make the fabric do what it needs to do. Now, generally, you can't get from one part of the fabric to the other without passing through a firewall um, or router. So depending on your network, uh, you'll make a decision to turn on or turn off this particular setting. Um, in our lab, um, I'm going to make the assumption that we're not doing anything really intelligent. So we don't have essentially even got the idea of firewalls. Instead, we got a few multiple different networks. Um, so as a result, they don't actually talk to each other. So I'll tick the box to tell VMM, don't try and actually pass traffic from one network to the other because it's simply not going to work. Now that's pretty cool too because we're going to look at that in a few minutes from the perspective of utilizing that same feature for doing things like isolation within our clouds. But for now we'll just use this from a fabric perspective. Now with our fabric logical network essentially named, um, we actually need to go ahead and tell the fabric what type of network we have. And because we're on a home network, we really only have one network right now and I'm going to call that the management network. And the only other thing that I need to really define on that management network is what host groups. So we've already seen, and we can still see it in the console, that my two Hyper-V hosts are listed under all hosts. So this management network will affect all hosts. And 
if there are some VLAN details, and as I mentioned already, we're not really using any VLAN specific magic in here, we can define that VLAN or the IP details. Um, and I'm going to uh, define what my IP address information is for this network. Slash 24. Now obviously you're going to change that to match up whatever you've got in your environment. Now if you've got additional networks um, that you want to uh, embed into your environment, for example we might want to do for, if we were building a cluster, we might do a cluster heartbeat and again you would define how many hosts will be able to see this particular network and again if we have any IP details or VLAN details that we need to do we can define them at this point. So for my heartbeat I'm going to go with just a completely different IP pool to keep things separate uh, so 172.21.220.0 slash 24 just as an example again you could put your heartbeat on the same network if that's what you desired similarly for live migration or any of the other different types of networks you're going to define. That's enough for us to get started with what we need for this particular one. Now, in the meantime, if I take a look at the jobs, I can see the virtual machine host work job is still continuing, um, and I can see that my first logical network and its site definitions have essentially been successfully created. So our fabric logical network is in place. Okay, so with our first one complete, let's go ahead and create a second logical network. This time I'm going to create a logical network that I'm going to do for my clouds, but it's going to be based on VLAN isolation. Now, as I mentioned in the last one, we can tell Virtual Machine Manager that these networks essentially are not connected, so it's an isolated solution. Uh, any virtual machines that we're going to put onto this uh, logical network won't be able to communicate with each other if they're not on the actual same uh, virtual network and we'll talk about those in a moment. But one of the things that's probably worth mentioning is that we're doing this on the cheap and dirty at home um, so the chances are you you have a switch that's not managed and you can't even do VLAN isolation uh, because you can't define VLANs. Well nothing's lost um, because we don't actually have to do VLAN isolation we can do it at the IP level. Now it's a proof of concept scenario, we're at home and we're in a lab so therefore if I decide that I'm going to go ahead and define uh, my first cloud VLAN and I'm going to call this VLAN 001 I can go ahead and instead of actually defining a VLAN because my switch gear doesn't support it I can just put in uh, the IP range that I want to use for this VLAN itself so 192.168.1.0 24 and make it available to all my hosts now following that same theory, if I done uh, another site, I can go ahead and make it available again to all my hosts, sorry this should be 0, 02, and I will pick a new IP range 192.168.2.0 slash 24. So just using IP isolation uh, in this case. Now the smart guy that has a virtual machine out there would probably know that he could dual home his IPs or put a second IP on his machine and actually see the nodes that are on the second VLAN. Um, but as we're doing this at home I I'm effectively going to trust that you understand that we're not using actual VLANs to do layer 2 isolation so therefore people can cheat. Um, but apart from that everything else pretty much works exactly the same way and we'll add just one more for uh, demonstrative purposes. So I'm going to go in here and just make this guy 192.168.3.0 and I'm making all my network slash 24. Uh, again that's out of habit you can make them whatever size works for you. Okay now those three logical networks are gone ahead and if I just take a look at the status of my jobs I can see that the jobs have completed to add the VM hosts which is pretty cool and uh, the first message back is telling me that there is no multipath IO. Now no brownie points for anybody figuring out what happens there. I only have one network interface so I am really only going to be able to do a single path so multipath IO is not going to happen. So that's a fine warning and we'll take it as a thank you very much Microsoft. Okay, now let's stick here with our cloud VLANs for a moment and one of the next things I'm going to do is I'm going to create an IP pool. So what I've just done uh, is defines that we have clouds that are going to be based on VLANs. No such thing as VLANs at home so we're just going to use IPs and pretend we've got VLANs and then I need to actually set up the IP pool. So I'm going to call this one 
uh, cloud VLAN format and it's 001 IP pool and if I take a look at the logical networks I have two choices my fabric or my cloud so I'm doing this for the cloud and now he turns around and says to me that I can use one of the existing ones so I've got cloud 001 and he figures out that on that cloud the IP range that I defined a few moments ago was 192.168.1.0 so that looks good the VLAN was set to 0 which means no VLAN um, and then I can say that the IP range available in that. Now if I want to exclude IP addresses or reserve them for pur special purposes I so can do um, I don't have a requirement. If I also want to put a default gateway which generally you will do on a VLAN um, I can go ahead and actually put that in so uh, normal scenarios here would say 192.168.1.1 that's normally the gateway or 254 depending on whatever your, your standard would be. Remember I don't actually have a router at the end of this so we're not actually going to get to the internet or anywhere because this gateway really doesn't exist. Um, similarly for DNS and DN, uh, DNS suffixes there's no real requirement for me to put these in here because again I don't have at home a gateway to get out to the internet from these little private networks 192s that I'm setting up. Um, so I can finish that off and effectively I get a static IP pool created for me. Now let's rinse and repeat and we can do the same thing for each of the other two um, clouds so again cloud VLAN number two IP pool and if I click over here I will now say I'm working on cloud number two he determines the IP range is correct and he also sees the starting and ending IP addresses look good for me I can again define that we should have a gateway 192.168 this one would finish at 2.1 and finish off our wizard and then just finally let's do one more just to keep things fully created um, and this one is going to be cloud VLAN number 3 IP pool and once more we're just going to tell him that we're going to use the VLAN that we've defined it's already got the right IP range, it's got the right starting and the IP addresses I'm going to be a good guy and put in the gateway 192.168.3.1 again doesn't really exist so we're never actually going to get out of this network and we are done so that's effectively our three VLANs uh, put into place now the fabric side I didn't bother making IP pools for um, I don't have to. Um, I'm just doing this to, to kind of prove to us that we can actually use IP pools for DHCP or static assigning IP addresses to the machines that we push into our cloud. I could of course do the same thing on the fabric if I wanted to. Uh, there's nothing stopping me so I could go ahead and do a fabric management. Oh there's no K on the end of that. IP pool and on this particular one I could say that uh, I have a management network is the one I want to use, there's the IP range, looks good, again we're no VLANs because our switch gear doesn't know how to deal with this stuff um, and I have starting and ending IP addresses and in this case I might decide that you know what I want to actually make sure that I'm only going to reserve IPs from a specific part because uh, I've got other stuff that may be joining my network so 172.21.10-1 that, sorry, that one through to um, 172, 21, uh, 10.230. They're not available, so it really only leaves me with about 20 IP addresses left at the end of the range that I could potentially use. So I'll say fine. Now there is really a gateway on this one, and the gateway is 172, 21, 10.1. And as far as a DNS server, uh, that's the DNS IP address, so it will be 172.21. And in my environment where I set up my Windows server, I was using the address 10.221. And if you want a DNS suffix, we could do diginerve dot lab, because that's what my network was called. So happy days, everything looks good, and we can finish that one off. Right, okay, so now I've gone ahead and I've made a, an IP pool for my fabric, 
I didn't have to do that if I didn't want and I done the same essentially for all of my other clouds. Now one thing that's worth noticing here is because I put an exclusion range in here only 24 of those IPs are available because I blocked out essentially 230 of the addresses when I was filling through the wizard. I didn't do that on my cloud so effectively all of the addresses are available to me to use. The only one that's reserved is the actual default gateway where we said dot one was going to be the gateway so that one got reserved to make sure we won't put that on a virtual machine. Alright, happy days. Everything is pretty good. Now Let's take a look at our Hyper-V servers and see if they actually have Hyper-V. So let's just log on to that server's interface. And before we know it, we should be seeing the console. So, as we wait for the actual uh, server manager to complete its task, we should see that the Hyper-V role has now been made available to us. And if I go and try and take a look at Hyper-V to see what's configured, I quickly notice that I don't actually have the user interface tools. The reason for that is because when Virtual Machine Manager goes ahead to actually configure Hyper-V on the servers, it's making an assumption that nobody is actually going to go back to the server and try and work on Hyper-V itself directly. That's not the case here at home. We're in the lab and we're playing with this thing, so we are likely to break and break. Um, so I'm going to go ahead as far as the remote server administration tools and the administration tools for roles. Select the Hyper-V management tools and let those get installed. So we can see here that the GUI and the PowerShell modules are both going to get deployed. Similarly, if I look at my second server, I should see pretty much exactly the same thing. Um, in this particular case, I'm not going to bother putting out the Hyper-V console because uh, we have enough information available on the first host to see what we want. Okay, that didn't take too many seconds, and if I now come back and right click, I should be able to see the Hyper-V Manager. And on my really top spec workstations, Hyper-V Manager will appear really, really quickly. Actually, it does appear pretty quick. So we've got Hyper-V in, no virtual machines, and if I go and take a look at the virtual switch, I actually see I have no virtual switches either. So that's our next task. We need to go and figure out how we're going to do the virtual switch. Now, should we do it here, or should we do it in VMM? That's correct. We certainly should do it in VMM. So let's come back down and take a look at Virtual Machine Manager. We're back still in the fabric view and this time I'm going to go down as far as port classifications. Now port classifications are used to educate VMM on how to actually define or design our ports. But if we take a quick look, all of our port classifications um, are really narrative type configurations telling us what sort of uh, type of traffic is going to be flowing across these. The first thing that we need to do, however, is we need to go to the nat native port profiles. Um, and when I look at the list of native port profiles, I find that they're all for native virtual adapters. That's no good to me. I need a physical adapter port profile. So let's see if we can make one of those. So let's right click and create a native port profile. I'm going to call this one my uplink because essentially this is the uplink on my desktop or my server um, port profile and I am basically going to define that it will be an uplink by default he's offering me yet another virtual adapter uh, type profile um, in this case then he wants to know how are we going to do our load balancing now uh, the default Hyper-V port is the correct option uh, in 90% of the cases when you're using Hyper-V um, and how are we going to do our teaming well we'll do it Switch independent quite simply because we're not really going to team. Um, switch independent is utilized normally when you're using two different switches and trying to distribute the actual team, the two interfaces, uh, onto two different switches. Um, in my case, I've only got one network interface in each of my Hyper-V hosts, so this stuff is pretty much irrelevant. Now, the next question in the wizard is really asking us what networks can actually go across this link. Um, so at home we are going to send across my three different clouds I've just created, uh, my management of course so I can get to the host and if I decide later on to cluster the stuff then I can also send the cluster heartbeat. Um, if there are more networks or logical networks that we define as we move forward um, we can add them back in here again a little bit later on. The other thing that we're going to tick is this little box down in the bottom corner saying enable Windows Network Virtualization. This essentially tells Virtual Machine Manager that when you're configuring that port on our Hyper-V servers that we want you to make sure that you enable the network virtualization features there too because we're going to look at software defined networks. Okay, that's all there's to that and yet another job completes nice and green.
With that job in place, um, we can take a look at the next step, which is essentially building our logical switch. Our logical switch is really another profile. It's essentially telling our Hyper-V server what the actual virtual switch should look like. So really it's only a new name or another profile. Now in this particular case um, the idea with a logical switch is more about distribution and standards. So I, I rather call a logical switch a distribution switch because it simply means that whatever I define here when I apply this to all of my Hyper-V hosts they'll all be configured exactly the same way. There's no tweaking changes or modifications. If I make a change on this it will make a change on each of the Hyper-V hosts. And that's kind of cool, especially when we think about the likes of those poor profiles a few moments ago when I need to add new logical networks. I don't have to go to each host separately and make those changes because it will be attached in a few minutes to this logical switch. And we will then go ahead and attach the logical switch to each of our hosts and we'll do that once and it'll be done. The next thing that we need to figure out is is there any special switch extensions because this is an extensible switch, it's one of the new features in 2012 where we can make more things happen. Um, so out of the box we got two, um, there are third parties uh, delivering additional ones. For now I'm just going to go with the defaults and accept what Microsoft is suggesting. And then we got to define are those uplink ports going to be teamed? Um, we've only got one network interface so we're not going to team. Now it's probably worth noting here that you can't change your mind. If you decide that this is likely going to be teamed in the near future then make this a single network interface team to start with and make sure your switch gear is ready to deal with that. Um, otherwise if you do need to change your mind you're going to have to delete the logical switch and start again. Uh, so just, just to highlight that one out there. The other thing is we're going to do is we're going to add up the port profile which we defined a few moments ago and again we can see that all of the bits and pieces that we said are going to communicate and the fact that it will support network virtualization so we'll add that in and on the next page we get to talk about any particular types of classifications so that's what we looked at a few moments ago the types of traffic that's going to go across this thing um, so I'm going to basically just say that for now the only thing I really care about is the host management classification and I will include that for host management as well when I make virtual network adapters because we're going to need to make one of those in a few minutes. In addition to our host management, um, other type of stuff that might be going across here um, for example might be just um, high bandwidth virtual machines or low bandwidth virtual machines or any type of virtual machines. So I'm just going to say that my virtual machines are going to run across here and they will probably want to use uh, the high bandwidth um, profile. Now why am I doing this twice? Um, really this is about lying to your end users. Um, I think that's probably the nicest way I can put this. Uh, a poor classification is a label. So I can turn around to the user and say that you're getting high bandwidth but behind the scenes you actually have a poor profile and the poor profile is the one that actually does the work. He turns around and tells you if there's a QoS setting. So I could actually assign the low bandwidth adapter profile to the high bandwidth classification. The user is going to see the classification so he's going to think, oh cool, I got the high speed bandwidth stuff, 10 gigs, happy days. But behind the scenes, you as the administrator, being very sneaky, you says, sorry, we got a 1 gig uplink, dude. <laughs> There's no way I can be offering you anything more than that. So we do a little bit of twisting the truth and hide it behind the scenes. So that's what that one has done for us. Right, so now we are one logical switch in play. We have our uplink port profile. We've took a look at our port classifications. So let's just go back for a second and take a look at that um, port profile that we suggested we might use, which if I remember right was called the low bandwidth adapter. So let's just double click that one. And here you can see what we really talk about. The minimum amount of bandwidth, maximum amount of bandwidth that we're going to offer to this particular port profile. And some additional settings. So again, if we had hardware that was smart enough, we could turn on and off things like VMQs and IPsec offloading and stuff like that. Also, on that profile, you can turn around and say that, well, we're not going to allow the guy run DHCP or routers within the environment, um, so I can turn those things. So if he built a virtual machine, turn on DHCP services on that thing, um, we effectively are going to filter that and not actually offer to any of the other VMs in his cloud. Okay. Now, now that we've got our logical switch and we've took a quick look at our classifications, as I said, lying back to the user. We tell them that's what we do um, and if I come back in you can see it is nothing more than a label. There's nothing in here other than 
a message that I'm going to show to my users. Um, we need to take that logical switch and make it work on our hosts. So let's pivot over to the host view and I can see my two Hyper-V hosts and I can see that there's one network interface each and I can also see there's an error message telling me that there is no connection yet to a logical network. Okay, so we're, we're almost there and we're kind of ready to do this but before we do that I'm going to switch my pivot over and I'm going to go to the VM networks because before we can do anything we really do need to make a VM network and we're going to make a VM network for the fabric and I'm going to call this one my management network and you're kind of asking yourself why am I doing this um, well it's actually really easy remember when we built a fabric we put two sites in there uh, we said one was going to be the management and um, the second one was going to be the cluster well now I actually need to bring this to life so I'm going to now turn around and say that I want that management network that we put onto that fabric to be bubbled up so effectively I'm now making this available for me to use so I'm turning around and I'm saying that I want a VM network it's called the management he's picked up the correct subnet VLANs and he presents it as an object back in VMM that's not really too complicated is it? so let's do that again um, and we'll think about the other one that we've done which was the cloud so I made a cloud VLAN network if I remember right Zero, zero, 001 and it was on the logical networks for the clouds and in there I did have the ability to select between the three different VLANs I created so I can make VLAN 1 and bring it up to me and obviously because I've got two more of them I could go ahead and do the same thing again cloud VLAN zero, zero, 002 and of course this one is going to use 002. Now if you notice the automatic one basically just checks and pulls one out of that list automatically for me and he works in sequence and if one's been deleted um, he'll put it back in the list so I can use again. Um, I want to be in control so therefore I'm actually specifying exactly what I want to do and I can keep going and define 003 as well as I start building my clouds but we'll come back to that later on. Now let's go back to the fabric because you're going to see now why we've done that. So we're still in the host pivot I can see my network interface and on host 1 if I take a look at the properties in host 1, I'm going to go down here as far as virtual switches. So we need to configure the virtual switch on the host, and to do that we're going to use that logical switch. Now remember I said a logical switch is a distributed switch or a profile, that's all it is. So it's going to tell us how we're actually going to define that virtual switch on the host. So I made a logical switch, we called it the extensible switch, and he's now offering me the list of interfaces that are available on that host. There is only the one interface which is the actual physical one so that's pretty cool. Um, it is worth noting that the name he's put on here is Broadcom Knit Extreme. It's not that nice friendly name that we typed in so if you've got multiple interfaces you're going to get hash 2, hash 3, hash 4 so that kind of makes things a bit messy. Um, and obviously uplink poor profiles we only have the one remember this is what we define will we team it, will we not team it, so we're telling uh, the switch how we should actually prepare the actual interface that we're connecting to. Now the other thing that we want to do is we want to actually make sure we can actually manage this machine. Um, so because I've only got the one interface, um, I need to actually make another virtual interface on the far side of the switch so the operating system can communicate with um, VMM. So I'm going to call this one my management M -A -N -A -G -E, management VNIC and that management VNIC is going to basically come from the management network. These are the VM networks we met a few moments ago so I'm going to the management network and are we going to assign the IP address dynamically or statically? Um, so I didn't bother making anything fancy here and I also wanted to pick a profile so this is going to be for host management so that's the profile I'm going to use. Okay so that's pretty much it. Now if I had gone ahead and defined pools of static IPs and stuff then of course this stuff wouldn't be grayed out and I could go ahead and pick those things um, but for now um, that isn't the case so they're grayed out um, and the system will pull them out for us. Okay now at this point in time we're about to start changing how the networking works on our host so if we've got this wrong what you're going to see is the job won't complete and we won't be able to ping our hosts and I lose RDP remote connection and everything else if on the other hand we got it right then we should be able to make our connections back to that host so let's uh, 
click the OK button let's check the jobs queue and let's wait and see if this thing completes okay fingers crossed and yeah it looks like the properties of the virtual switch job has actually indeed completed and I can see that all of the bits and pieces went in it installed the extension it installed so the first extension he installed here is for DHCP and the second extension is for network virtualization he's configured it and everything looks hunky dory so we didn't mess up here and let's just switch back so I did lose RDP connection uh, that's probably when he killed uh, the network as he rebuilt it so let's see if I can log back in and if all has gone well let's click now again on the virtual switch manager and I can see my extensible switch has now been created and I can see the tick boxes in place uh, so that we can actually manage the operating system so essentially we've done everything we need to do to make this thing work now at that point in time if I take a look I can see that new extension gone in here for the DHCP that I mentioned and the Windows filtering so we are set everything is hunky dory so that looks good on the first toast so now switching back to VMM switch back to the fabric view keep the pivot on the host and what the thing what we notice now is that we actually have the extensible switch now listed and I can now see that my management VNIC that network interface that I put in a few moments ago that now has actually got bound into play as well because that's associated to my switch so back on my hosts let's go and do the same exact configuration for host 2 so again onto virtual switch new virtual switch it's of a logical type it's extensible I've only got the one port and then I need to make sure that I include my management VNIC so happy days make sure I pick the right type so browse that it's on the management network of course and again it will be used for the host management communications everything looks okay and again if the gods are with us switch back to the jobs view we should see that things are going to work through um, and we're pretty confident this time things should actually work because this is the beauty of a logical switch as I said, profiler distributed. What works on one essentially should work on all of the rest of them that are set up the same way. So we've got to a point in time now where we'll probably take a moment's break um, and, and just look at what we've completed. We've taken two desktop machines with a single network interface. We've built a virtual network interface on top of that. We've had virtual machine manager push out an agent, configure Hyper-V and configure the actual logical networks or the virtual network switches on that environment. We've also taken a quick look at some of the networking concepts that sit down in VMM including things like the virtual network adapters, the port profiles, the classifications, as I said, I lie to our customers, um, and we've gone away and built both um, the logical networks, which we took a quick peek at a few moments ago, uh, signed some IP pools to those logical networks, and also went away and set some VM networks that we were able to pass back as far as our hosts so that we can build these virtual networks on top of the virtual switch. So, what comes next? We're going to take a look at actually pushing out a, a new cloud and a virtual machine, and then we'll come back and another take a look at seeing if we can actually do something around uh, maybe software defined networking. I hope you've enjoyed it. Have fun, try and rebuild it, and of course, keep pinging me either here on YouTube or back on my blog at damienflynn.com.